Science fiction author and queen of cyberpunk, Pat Cadigan, joins this episode of the Plutopia podcast. We explore cyberpunk, artificial intelligence, and her recent novelizations of classic sci-fi movies and Japanese anime. Pat tells us she has no plans to write her own movie scripts. I am probably the wrongest person in the whole world to ever consider writing a screenplay because apparently you have to pitch this stuff. And my idea of a pitch is studio executives come to me and explain why I should give them the time of day. I don't make, you know, 30 second pitches on elevators to guys who can't read. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I, I, I've had just enough of Hollywood, you know, over the years to know that, uh, I'm probably not a good candidate for for writing for, for a studio. They, the other thing that they all seem to have is, is industrial strength ADHD, where they're all excited about one project, and it's all they can talk about, and then suddenly you don't hear anything about it, and everyone's on to something else. Hey everybody, welcome to the latest edition of the Plutopia News Network podcast. I'm John Lebkowski, and uh, I'm here with my partner in crime, Scoop Sweeney, and other partner in crime, Wendy Grossman. And we're here today to talk to Pat Cadigan, who is a science <laughs> fiction author and the undisputed queen of cyberpunk. Hello, Pat. Well, hello there. How are you? Here I am again. Here I am <laughs> again. Well, you know, it's uh, at least we're not all locked down anymore. And uh, uh, well, although, we never although, were here, actually. So yeah, well, okay, but um, we should have no, been, but we weren't. <laughs> well, this year, after after not after dodging COVID for three years. I had it twice this year, and uh, but it was uh, by then it had, thanks to the uh, the vaccinations and everything, that that fortified me. And it, the the virus seems to have mutated into a pain in the ass rather than you know the uh, the life threatening illness that it was when we when we started out in this pandemic. So. From what I read, it's less that it's mutated and more that there's a lot more immunity around. Uh, well, that must be it. But it did keep me from going to the World Fantasy Convention. I'm kind of still kind of pissed off. Oh, that's off a bummer. For that. Yeah. So, well, what's on anyone's we mind? Finally, we finally had COVID in our house. It took a long time to get it, and it wasn't very bad. So I hope that yours was pretty mild. Yeah, it was. Was that the case? You know, it was sort of like it oh, bounced off. So. so I, you know, you're the queen of cyberpunk, undisputed queen of cyberpunk, <laughs> and you have written this novelization of Ultraman. Yes, I know. And have. I'm just wondering if you see any alignment between the Ultraman-like universe and the cyberpunk universe. Well, I'll tell you, all of the tie-in uh, writing that I've done has actually tied into some part of my life. Uh, my, my first one that I did for Titan Books was Alita Battle Angel. And my, I used to read the, 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 the manga to my son. He was a big Battle Angel Alita fan. And uh, I found out later that um, part of, part of, Battle, of Battle Angel Alita is set in the Kansas City area. And that's why it's called, they have a bar called the Kansas Bar. It's actually set in Kansas City. So I just, I felt a little frisson there. But, uh, and then I, uh, I worked on um, uh, Mad Love with Paul Dini. And that was, that was a, that was a blast. And uh, my son and I used to watch the Batman, the animated series every morning before he went to school. It was our deal. He'd, I'd let him watch Batman and he'd go to school. So, uh, and it worked out really well. And then um, 
I'm probably missing something here, but uh, uh, so get to where, oh yeah, um, <laughs> Ultraman. I was getting back to Ultraman, I promise. I used to run home from school when I was 12, 13 years old to watch Ultraman on the fuzzy UHF channel uh, that, that, we, that would come in from Boston if the weather was really good. It was either, either, it was one of two channels, but they were fuzzy, fuzzy UHF channels. And you could see a lot of stuff on them if you could see it through the through the static, of course, you could see a lot of stuff on them that you couldn't see ordinarily. And I was just fascinated with the, they had anime and I'd never seen anime before. And it was so beautiful. And, uh, but then uh, Ultraman was, it was really exciting because it wasn't American and it wasn't even Western, you know, it was in a foreign language, from the other side of the world. And, you know, it's like, if it was from the other side of the world, I was for it. If it was from off the world, I was even more for it. But, um, so I used to run home and, and, and watch it. And uh, there was one, what they say, one season of Ultraman uh, live action. But one season was 39 episodes. So it's a lot of episodes. And, um, <clears throat> and so there was a there was a lot to see as long as the love was good enough to get the channel so and you know to now of course i don't remember a whole lot about them but um uh, i they're just a very happy memory for me and when uh titan asked me if i'd be interested in working on ultraman i thought well you know this is this is my the story of my life and it's out of order <laughs> You know, but uh, in in books, and it was fun. Uh, well, there's like sixty years of Ultraman. How do you decide which part of that to to use to base the book on? Well, the one the one that I watched on TV when I was a kid, and the one that they gave me was the very first. Was it the first series or the second? You know, I'm was not it sure. Ultra Q. No, was that called, no. called Ultra Q or no. it was Ultraman? No, it okay. wasn't Ultra Q. It was Ultraman, and it was live action. And um, uh, anyway, they 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 sent me the and the studio had uh, had uh, de definite episodes in mind that they wanted um, to line up it as part of the story. So I went along with that, and I thought they 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 picked fairly well because it highlighted. Uh, different aspects of of what Ultraman could do, and uh, and it was it was fun. It was it was a different kind of thing, and rather than you know just really trying to make uh, an unbroken sequence novel out of it, I went with the episodic nature of the story because uh, because after all, you know that's that's how we see our lives anyway as episodes. You know, so um, so, but I'm I'm kind of happy with it. And uh, we had a we had a signing at uh, Forbidden Planet in um, in in uh, oh London, yeah, that's where I live, London. <laughs> and uh, um, it wasn't for uh, Ultraman, but uh, several people told me, including one of the um, one of the people who works there. That they'd read the book and they really liked it, and uh, and I just hope that uh, it it's as well received because uh, I was very conscious of working in a culture that I didn't belong to, and at the same time, uh, it was it was um, not seeing that culture as the population of a small island, but as a, you know, a very strong cultural force within the world. And, uh, um, and I enjoyed that, you know, I, I, I didn't quite formulate a, as solid a picture in my mind of the world as I normally do when I'm working on a book. 
but it it worked it worked well enough so that uh, I just had to live with the fact that there were some things that I wasn't going to explain um, sort of by the way or incidentally. And uh, and that was OK. Nobody was wondering except me. <laughs> I was, Did that make sense at all? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was exposed to anime uh, early on, thanks to it being in the Bay Area and there being some really eclectic uh, stations that uh, that aired uh, really old stuff. And I thought I was being, I was really in on it and really hip until I encountered my nieces who were way younger than me. <laughs> and they <laughs> are just totally into it. And it's, they're into stuff that uh, was... 50 years, 60 years older than them. And I just was humiliated. Okay, you're, you're the expert. I'm just an old guy. But uh, I've encountered on, on science fiction and anime and uh, cyberpunk social media sites, people who continue to say, well, cyberpunk is dead. And, <laughs> as, and as queen of cyberpunk, is it dead? And if so, who killed it? <laughs> Nothing is dead. You know, I, you're not going to convince me that any anyone is dead unless you show me, the, you know, you cut off their head, the silver stake is, is through their heart. Now, nothing's dead. And it's because we now have the capacity and the capability to record uh, all of our culture in video, in writing, in sound, and, and you know, all of that. We, we've, we've figured it out. And uh, as long as we have all that, the jazz age isn't dead. You know, the Roaring Twenties aren't dead. The Gilded Age isn't dead. Uh, we, have, we have been keeping, you know, uh, relics and, and, and memorabilia and, 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 and museum pieces and everything. But from about the... Uh, I'd say from the 20th century, probably on, at least in the West, we will, you know, we will be living side by side with our memories. Until, you know? until the internet age begins. And then all of a sudden things start being lost because not even if you have a copy of the thing, you don't necessarily have a machine that will play it. No, no. I that's mean, one of, the, one of the great ironic stories that I'm sure you're aware of is that the BBC did a did a sort of doomsday book for two, the year 2000. And it couldn't <laughs> be read 10 years later, whereas the original doomsday book is still readable centuries on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody's got a floppy disk drive anymore. Uh, actually, I do. I have a USB <laughs> floppy drive. I okay. Save in okay, case I... of emergency. <laughs> I stand for That would be anyone, handy. Anyone with an emergency floppy disk, you've got to see Wendy. Dead media. Mm -hmm. I so, actually encountered a, a zip drive the other day. Wow. If you remember zip drives. I, uh, remember I threw a bunch drive. of that stuff out. But yeah. I mean, it. the media is gone, but the, you know, the content can persevere, can, can move from one medium to another. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I'm just wondering about, so, Let's say we do agree that cyberpunk is sort of dead or over or whatever, and we now have a cyberpunk museum. What do we put in it? Uh, I don't know that, that it's dead enough for a museum, you know, because it has actually, it's more like it's, it's integrated into, you know, we live in kind of a cyberpunk age. But it doesn't feel well, I was like going to say, it's kind of nonfiction now. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> my novel, Sinners, when, uh, it, when I have signings and people bring it to me, I tell them there's not as much fiction in it as, uh, as there used to be. And they'll say, was it suppressed? And I'll say, no, honey, it just caught up. And, uh, um, but it's true. I, Actually, I, I lucked out, I guess, right on uh, on a number of things in centers. So, you know, it's, it's like, is your is your old life, um, is your own life dead? 
you know, is is the view from the eighties dead? Well, technically speaking, wouldn't wouldn't we have uh, replaced all our cells in that time? Yeah, but um, I'm not sure if you replace all of brain cells. So some of the original brain cells certainly must be there. Okay. Might just leave and don't come back. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm going it, to. <laughs> it, it doesn't surprise, you know, when you're talking about your, your no, novel being caught up with by, by, by reality. I mean, the very first time Pat and I met was at the 1996 Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference, and Pat was on a panel. What was it? It was Werner Vinge and you, and I think Bruce Sterling and one yep. other. Who's, and who was the fourth one? Tom partner? Maddox. Right. Tom Maddox. I was there the late too. Tom Maddox. And the only thing yeah. I remember from this panel is Pat imagining a future in which you're you're pushing a, a shopping cart around a supermarket and it's reporting to your insurance company what what you know and and getting back sort of well you shouldn't buy this <laughs> it's so oh yeah if you're gonna buy this you're going to pay three times as much yeah because it's yeah. bad and for I mean you. that seems that that has always seemed to me uncomfortably coming closer and closer somehow. Yeah, well, I, I kind of saw it coming when uh, employers started uh, started becoming smoking Nazis, and uh, they they, you know, you had to quit smoking in order to you know get some of your benefits. I'm not sure if they ever got away with, you know, canceling someone's yeah. health insurance because this this is <laughs> bless you, darling. My my husband was just sneezing in the background. That was not a ferocious animal. Um, uh, boy, I, you know, I had a point. I'm you, sure you, I had a you, point. You were saying you oh, were health saying insurance and employers, and yeah, they they for a while it seemed to be your employer will not insure you unless you can prove that you're healthy enough to be worth the trouble. But yeah. Uh, that probably that, went that away. comes up with life insurance a lot too. Like you have to be, you have to convince them that you're going to live for a very long time before they'll sell you any life insurance. And I mean, it makes sense from, from their end of the bargain, but it's like the thing about, um, uh, pre-existing conditions. You know, if you have a pre-existing condition, it makes sense that an insurance company wouldn't want to insure you but it really diminishes the value of the insurance too. Well, this is why those of us who live outside the U.S. are such fans of things like the NHS. Oh, yeah, I, indeed. You know, you're going back to the to the states for the holidays. Uh, I no longer have any any more family in the states, so you know it's like we stay here all year round. And um, if someone said. Uh, you have to go back to the States, Pat. You got, you got to go live there. I wouldn't be able to afford to stay alive. Right. So I mean, how do how do how do people in the UK, both of you could answer this. How do people in the UK see the USA now, uh, considering that we've gone completely batshit crazy over here? Well, the two things that I get asked about all the time are, are, are why, why the US has this insane health insurance system, A, and B, why does the US have all these guns? I don't know. What do you get asked, Pat? Uh, pretty much the same thing. You know, it's like, what is it with the guns? And why are you afraid of health insurance? You know, and uh, um, I I cannot, you know, I don't understand it. When, when people say, talk to me about it, I'll say, you're right. I don't understand it. It's batshit crazy. Well, I sort of understand it in the sense of it. I think one of the cleverest things they did was present it as a perk of, of, of employment so that it's kind of like, you know, you've arrived as a person and, and an adult and you have a good job because you have health insurance. And, you know, but I have come to understand that the effect of tying health insurance to employment really has turned the U.S. into a nation of peasants. You know, yeah, I have well, a friend, I have a friend in this country who quit his job on the day his first child was born to do a startup. I don't think there's an American oh. alive who could afford to do that. No, no. I, in fact, I'd call that not just tempting fate, but baiting fate. But that's just me. 
Um, no, I, 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 it wasn't always this way in the States, although I remember uh, I, I went to work for Hallmark because at the time they had the best health insurance. And when I left Hallmark, they were, they weren't even near the middle of, you know, the middle of good. They were, the, the, the health insurance was terrible. And, uh, uh, and I remember, you know, thinking, wow, you know, and I'd only worked for them for 10 years, within 10 years, you know, this, this had happened. And, uh, um, and I thought, geez, if I wait another 10, we might have to work outside in tents. Well, can I uh, bring up the uh, digital elephant in the room, artificial okay. intelligence? And that's become a big deal. Of, uh, the EU, I, I think, has been the only uh, government, if you will, uh, that's actually paying attention to controlling you know, uh, what is AI and you know, what is it going to do to us. And uh, in science fiction, that was always, you know, uh, a big feature, you know, artificial intelligence was either going to save the world or destroy it. And uh, how is it looking in, in in the UK? Are they really paying attention to AI? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of coverage, but um, um, you know, I I'm really sorry because I've been out of things because I've been so immersed in work. And then when artificial intelligence came along, it was like, oh God, one more thing I've got to keep track of. And uh, I, you know, it's like trying to, uh, trying to bookmark all of these things and keep up my, uh, uh, my, my rate of work has been, so I, I beg off, it's just sort of ignorant of a lot of stuff, but I don't think anybody I don't think anybody outside the field of AI has really any any grasp of of what AI is. And the people who talk most alarmingly about AI are people who are automatically assuming that AI will have certain traits like um like AI will be acquisitive it will it will want to have it will or it will want to control and uh, as near as i can tell um the desire to have or to control is something that uh that has to be developed in a way that uh i don't see it sort of just emerging spontaneously in ai I suppose you could write an algorithm to be acquisitive, but it's you could, kind of not then, likely. Yeah, you could, but then uh, acquisitive or uh, or curious or anything like that is uh, it's it's not real if it's an algorithm. Exactly, exactly. There's a lot of confusion about AI that sort of because it mimics the way humans think and the way humans now it mimics pretty well the way humans converse and there's this idea that it inherently must eventually develop a self-awareness and become sentient in the sense that human beings are and that's not a given in fact that's extremely unlikely probably not at all possible well, see, that's the thing. It it would be another form of life, which would not necessarily mimic us completely. You know, it would, I mean, if you were confronted with a form of life whose, uh, whose first impulse is to ask you who you are, ask you uh, what you, what you want, if you want something, um maybe maybe somewhere out there is a race that uh, apologizes for taking up space you know when they're somewhere they they shouldn't be physically i don't know 
But if you um, if you had an AI that was uh, it was made to made as a helper, then it would probably walk or ambulate or perambulate around looking for people to help and uh, anyone could stop it and get help from it, you know or get a question answered I, i've got this mental image suddenly in my head of the uh of all the bikes in uh in london and the, the rental bikes except uh now they all look like upright vacuum cleaners they've got faces where the handles should be and they want to know if you have a question the thing is, you 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 are you sound like an optimist. You know, I have to say that as soon as you said that, all I could think about was, you know, the 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 AI that you go up to and say, "Would you help me plant this bomb, please?" <laughs> I mean, I think I think the potential for abuse is really extraordinary there. Yeah, well, you know, it would be too with a human being if you didn't tell them what a bomb is. So naturally, an AI would have to would have to have all the you know. The, the common and uncommon reference and uh generally it should be you know in 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 their data banks that planting bomb bad ah, but now you're trying to write the asimov's three laws i'm, get, mm -hmm. I'm told rely told by reliable computer scientists that actually programming those is impossible oh well okay but um if you had if you had AIs that were, say, specialized and uh, um, specialized, say, <laughs> maintenance security guards. An AI will take that. A human will want more money. The thing, that's, the thing that scares me about sort of the UK approach to AI is um, <clears throat> the, the, the politicians, anyway. Uh, some of them have got hold of the idea that Britain can be a world leader in AI. And they, I have actually been at a conference where, where a minister said, and I don't remember which minister it was, said something like, we're number three in the world behind the US and China, and we, we can do even better than that. And you sit there and you go, even, even better, you think you have more data than China? <laughs> you think you have more technology companies in the U.S.? What, what is this fantasy, you know? Well, but see, that's that's actually the problem. The problem with AI isn't AI. The problem with AI is us. Yes. What we shouldn't be saying is we could be the world leader. Yes. It, we, it, it's more like let's work together and and build something. And, you know, it's... I don't know where people got the idea that, you know, it's like you get one guy and he's the savior or one world leader in something, you know. I blame such, Heinlein. Well, maybe, but I don't think his influence was quite that pervasive. No, but it seems to have influenced a generation of libertarians. You know, one of my friends who's very, very sharp at analyzing what magazines do said to me once that the archetypal wired story is a wild, crazy guy standing in the middle of a field defying the establishment. And that's <laughs> really very much Heinlein and this kind of libertarian idea of, you know, the, 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 the Ayn Rand, the individual hero, who you know, and and I'm sorry, but you know, su Superman and and all the other superheroes, you know, they feed into that too. Yeah, I know. And, Elon and, Musk. Oh God! You have to cross your fingers <laughs> when you say Elon Musk. Yeah. Elon Musk. Yeah, that's. But what he, I mean, he's now. he's he, he's what you can expect from that kind of thinking. He's like the uh, quintessential tech billionaire, right? And he's kind of a cyberpunk figure too. He, some of those cyberpunk billionaires, I would imagine, would be a whole lot like Elon Musk, or Donald oh. Trump, or Donald Trump. Well, I don't think they're cyberpunk. They just have all the cyberpunk toys because they're the only ones that can afford them. See that but truck? <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine driving one of those. And I mm. had a pickup truck. 
No, I haven't. I haven't seen it yet. I. Um, it's like all planes and angles and. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I can guess. I think the the billionaires are all building bunkers, and uh, I guess there's a possibility that they'll retreat to their bunkers at some point, and then just let the rest of us destroy well, yeah. ourselves. No, it's after what Douglas Rushkoff called the the event. Oh in yeah, survival of the richest, where he was invited out to the desert to t explain to a bunch of technology, if not billionaires, at least hundred millionaires. You know, they they he he thought he was asked to predict for them about the future, but actually all they wanted to know was things like, you know, uh, what's the safest place to to put my bunker for, for after the event. And he, he started to really co come to grips with it when one of them said, how can I keep my private security force loyal to me? <laughs> <You know? It's> like... <laughs> oh, my God. You know, this reminds me of something, of something my mother said. My, my mother died in 2012, not long after Barack Obama was reelected. And she loved Barack Obama. She thought he was the greatest. And the night that he was elected, we were, we were watching the return and sitting up late watching, watching everyone celebrate. And my mother said, maybe they should all be black. And I said, who should all be black? She said, all the presidents. And because my, my mother is a very progressive person, but this didn't sound like her. And I said, well, what would make you say that? And she said, you know, Barack Obama is obviously very well educated but i get the feeling that if i met him on the street and i told him what my life was like he would understand it these white guys come from they might as well be from a different planet because they're all out of privilege and and wealth and they you know it's like they haven't they, they they've probably never been to the grocery store for themselves unless it was a prank uh, Q Rishi Sunak, the current UK Prime Minister, trying to put gas in his own car. <laughs> yeah, I'm, and I'm recalling that the George George H W Bush lost his uh, second presidential election because yeah. he didn't know the price of a of a milk at a grocery store. Yeah, um, I don't think somebody had asked him that question. Lost. I don't think that's the only. Oh, reason. come on now. Yeah. You think there was something else? Well, he Let's he and, it down to something simple. Well, I remember he and his wife went to supermarket, and they were just enchanted by the futuristic boops and beeps. They'd never seen, you know, the cash registers that that we have now. Well, the futuristic uh, boops and beeps at the supermarket are starting to fall on hard times because. Of, all these big retailers have put in the self-check oh. machines and now they're starting to pull them out because people have been so incensed that the, you know among other things you you don't have to hire a bunch of people uh, a bunch of locals to your store you just put in beeps and boops and <laughs> and, uh. and you don't have to pay out the wages or pay for benefits but people are beginning to uh, respond so negatively that uh, some of the big uh, box stores are now taking those back out and hiring people. Well, well apparently they're they're not proving to be as efficient as they hoped they would be because people get really confused by them and they're constantly having to get somebody to come over and help. So now yeah. if you, at Costco at the self checkout, they have now put persons at the self checkout and they just check you out at the self checkout. So it's oh, not really God. a self checkout. It's check out with a friend. I really, yeah, hate, yeah. I really hate the way those machines instruct you like you're two years old, you know? Well, I always, I always get the broken machine, but <laughs> I can, I never know the machine is broken. It starts out really well and then everything goes bad. And I end up sort of having, having charged myself twice for half of everything that I want. Then I have to go in search of someone to please cancel all this out and help me, help me get out of this store, you know, with, see, with see, my to me, stuff. That's what the world, see, to me, that's what the world of AI is going to be like. It's going to be, yeah. you know, 
it's going to be all these program things that don't do any of the things you really need them to. And you're going to be, you know, you're going to, you're going to be struggling with them all the time. See, the thing is that artificial intelligence is never really truly intelligent. Uh, I have yet to see it. I mean, even with, uh, I mean, I, I have found the various chat, like chat GPT, Google Bard, those sorts of things helpful. Uh, but, but they're like accelerated search engines and they can feed stuff back in a fairly sophisticated way. They can even write computer programs, but I don't get the sense for a minute that they're intelligent. And, and I've had the problem that many people report of hallucinations. In other words, you ask it something, it gives you a very reasonable answer and you find out that the very reasonable answer was wrong. So I don't, <laughs> yeah, it, I don't find trust out them. At the heart of AI is I a had kid trying to like fake that. his way through a book report. I had an ex-husband like that who would give you a reasonable answer that would turn out to be wrong. <laughs> it's a we skill. All look that guy at least. Donald Trump will give you an unreasonable oh answer God. that will turn out to be crazed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want an AI that will explain to me why he's still he's still running around loose. Well, you know, the Street part smarts. of AI that uh, that frightens me <laughs> is its ability to just go out and harvest data, personal data, all sorts of data. And that's, of course, going to be for sale on the open market. Well, not the, maybe not the open market, but the, there are companies that that's what they specialize in is all that harvested data. And that's that's the thing that frightens me. Well, that's the fun thing, because one of the other things over here is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Wendy, data mining is illegal, isn't it? Not exactly. I think there is a there is a database directive from the European Union that uh, I think everybody hates, which was an which was an attempt to protect databases from like being copied wholesale. Mm. Um, there was data mining was I forget which EU thing it was in re more recently. Uh, and I can't remember how it came out. I, I don't think it's exactly illegal, but I think there, there are restrictions because of the data protection laws. Ah, okay. Yeah, certain data that can't be. Yeah, and I mean, really this, country was always, this always, country was always a little bit paranoid about things, you know, like in the, in the U.S., you can go to a library and find a crisscross directory and look up who lives at, <clears throat> you know, whose mm -hmm. residential landline phone number this is or who lives at an address, but in this country, those were illegal. Yeah, and in America, you can have a police radio. Here, that's illegal. Yeah, the, and and knives. They have a real thing about knives. Yeah. You oh, know, well, like, you're not allowed to carry like a knife. I think if you buy a kitchen knife, you're allowed to take it home, but that's about it. <laughs> but the paper had better be on the blade. And paper. you have to be over 18. Yeah because i don't know 15 year olds are going to stab people i i don't know what the reasoning is mm. so what are the gun laws like there in the uk no guns anywhere no guns yeah. you if you own a gun you have to keep it at a gun club that has a proper proper lockup and everything you can't have it at home i think there are a few exceptions Man. for, for aimed at specific things for farmers maybe yeah, if you if you have a farm, you can have a shotgun because you might actually need it. Yeah, this but otherwise, is... you know, yeah. I mean, and it leads to wonderful incidents. Like, was it a few years ago that there was a guy who was going apeshit on uh, Westminster Bridge and somebody saw him out the window from the local fishmongers hall and ran out, grabbed the nearest weapon he could think could find and ran out and kept him at bay with a narwhal horn that had been hanging <laughs> on the wall. I mean, you just don't get stories like that in the States. No, no. No, you, no, you got to be creative out here. 
I'm afraid the stories here in the United States are are grim at the moment. Yeah, uh, somewhat. I want I want to shift gears for a minute because uh, when I contacted you a little bit earlier, you mentioned sushi, and I'm just wondering if you're gonna are you gonna write a novel based on that kind of yeah, universe? Yeah, I've story? written I've written about half of it so far. Wow, and. Uh, I had to I had to set it aside because I had to take care of some uh, of of paying the bills and whatnot. But uh, I'm at a place where I can think about getting getting back to it in a very serious way. So um, wow, that'll be great. How did but I, I've had to do a lot of thinking about uh, about AI, in fact, because uh, AI is is actually one of the plot strands. And uh, and I was thinking a lot about AI and individuals and how, um, you know, it's like if you have a computer network, you don't have, you don't really have several computers networked together. You have a bigger computer. And I was thinking that AI will probably show its intelligence by mitosis by dividing in two if it can produce if there are two individuals individual intelligences that are actually discrete they are separate from each other then that's you know i think that's one of one of the warning signs maybe of an artificial intelligence i always thought a sign of intelligence would be that the ai got bored yeah or jealous <laughs> yeah maybe a little be... jealous yeah well but it could feign jealousy i don't know how you yeah. feign being bored yeah well supposedly the the sign that we should be looking for is that the ai becomes homicidal it decides mm. that humans yeah. are not you know, worthwhile and wants to eliminate them you know i, think, I don't if think we we'll pay, if we pay attention to our ais and treat them with respect, we'll be able to spot the homicidal ones, you know, coming from a distance. They won't surprise us. But if we, uh, um, if, if we do not have any kind of, of idea of respect of one type of uh, arrangement of intelligence for another type, then uh, we'll probably reap what we sow. Well, I'm, I'm waiting for the development of the AI stalker, the one that falls in horrendously in love with someone or something and just <laughs> won't give it up. That's a good story there. I'm sorry. I am not going to be polite to machines just in case they decide to become hostile and, and, and human. Uh, oh, you know, I, I, you know, it's like, don't throw your phone across the room. Why not? <laughs> My phone, I paid for it. You know, I mean, I, you know, there are these people who say, well, <clears throat> who want their kids to be polite to the Alexa because, you know, they don't want them to learn to be rude to humans. And my feeling is it's an Alexa. You can shout at it if you want to. I mean, the whole point of having devices. Well, there's an interesting thing. There's an interesting thing there. I, I used, I have over time, uh, I'm a little odd for doing this, but I would tell Siri, thank you when Siri helped me. And I never got a response after saying thank you. And the other day I said thank you to Siri and she said, you're welcome. So the, <laughs> the AIs are you. learning, well, the AIs are learning to appreciate. No, you know, uh, no, somebody at Apple decided to put the feature in. And that's the thing, you called, no, it, no, she was you just, called it she, it's not a she, it's an it. Mine is a she. My well, wife has, has a Siri a that's a guy. Mind. No, it has a female voice. It is not a person. It does not have gender. Well, it, maybe. I feel very strongly she sounds... about this. I feel very strongly about this because so why do you, many... Why do you feel so strongly about it? Because so many of these machines that are designed to serve have female voices. Oh, they've got options. You can have either. Yeah. But you didn't choose that, did you? You chose to have Siri be female. 
Well, it's true. Female with the default, and I didn't even realize I could change it until Marcia changed hers to a, a guy. Well, I'm sorry. I think she likes better. a very early name. So. Yeah, it does. We always called our um, uh, GPS, whatever GPS system we were using, we referred to as as female, and we named her Lucy. And we've had several iterations of Lucy from. I honestly think a boat has, I don't more, has more. I, I honestly think a boat has more entitlement to the female pronoun than than a than a, than an AI does. I just think women are more nurturing than men are. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, so getting back. Yes. To Pat. Uh, so when you're writing, so you're writing, you've written mostly fiction that came completely out of your head, but then you're writing a novelization here and there that is based on uh, an existing sort of universe and an existing uh -huh. character set and whatever. Uh, does it feel really different doing one from the other or, or are they all, is it pretty much well, the same process? No, it really is. It really is different. You know, it's um, um, the process that I go through to turn a screenplay into, into text, into a prose is uh it's like two steps first i prosify it in you know and, and it's just bare bones so that it's uh you know now it says he said instead of you know whatever stage directions were and um and then uh then i go through it again and turn it into something worth you know the first draft of something worth reading and uh it's actually a lot of fun it reminds me why I love writing, and uh, um, and it's uh, it's interesting to see what you can do with um, with some of the uh, the smaller characters, or the you know the walk ons and the and the and the spear carriers, and there, you know it it tells me something when I'm doing that that I'm you know when I'm uh, uh, doing writing in a bit of business for uh, the background characters or the characters who are in the same scene, but, uh, you know, aren't, aren't in, in the uh, hero or heroine's uh, particular event. Um, it reminds me to do that in my own work that, you know, you have to, you have to really color in for textures you know i i don't know if i'm making any sense at all i i must be no I, I, I get it I, I, do you have to invent some of the characters i mean obviously there's some characters that would come from the source material but do you do you do a lot of invention in addition to that of characters well, sometimes, and also plot sometimes i invent things for the you know the the walk on characters or the um uh, uh, spear carriers, but uh, and sometimes I give them names if they don't have names, and uh, and I found that sometimes that comes in handy because uh, then later on you you know you have uh, you, you have some sequence that calls for the same setting or the you know being around the same people, and you have something that knits. The story together better so that it seems more like you're reading a book and and there are lots of characters that are very connected to to what's going on rather than just the um just the adaptation of of screenplay to to text i have thought about going the other oh i, I have some friends that uh are really into fan fiction do you have any, has anyone written fan fiction versions of any of your works? Believe it or not, somebody wrote fan fiction after the end of Sinners. And I found it and I read it. And uh, um, I don't know if I found a way to get in touch with the person or not, but I, you know, I really want 
want her to, I, and I believe it was a woman, if I'm remembering correctly, I want her to, you know, write her own stuff. She is good. You know, she's very good. And uh, um, I know of a lot of people who've kind of gotten started, you know, really in fan fiction. They they find that uh, they're they're writing for one reason, and then they discover that, hey, I ha kind of have a a good good ability with story, or I have a good ability with dialogue, and so they discover you know their own voice and their own words that way. And I you know I encourage people not to you know steal steal and and you know violate copyright or anything, but to do things that will stretch you and maybe maybe you'll find out that you have a talent that you've been ignoring. I'm staring around here. I have a copy of Sinners, but I don't know where it is. I, I was going to hold it up. <laughs> oh, well. I think it's in the other room. So <laughs> have you considered writing a screenplay? Oh, I've considered Going it. Going the other direction. Well, uh, I am probably the wrongest person in the whole world to ever consider writing a screenplay because apparently you have to pitch this stuff. And my idea of a pitch is studio executives come to me and explain why I should give them the time of day. I don't make, you know, 30 second pitches on elevators to guys who can't read. Yeah. I'm <laughs> I I I've had just enough of Hollywood, you know, over the years to know that uh, I'm probably not a good candidate for for writing for for a studio. They the other thing that they all seem to have is this industrial strength ADHD where they're all excited about one project and it's all they can talk about. And then suddenly you don't hear anything about it and everyone's on to something else, you know. Get, it seems to be a, a terrible trick to be, to be able to get to studios to stick to something long enough for it to be produced into something of value and then see how it does. But, and it's, you know, and it's gotta be, it's got to be over the top successful or it's not successful. You know, it's like, give me strength. There's nothing about that business that makes sense. And, uh, uh, but you know, they manage. So, uh, like I said, I'm the wrong person. If anyone wants to, you know, wants to option any of my work, that's fine. Take it. God bless. I think I can't forget who it was that got up at some meeting of like Hollywood writers and said everyone in this room either has or will either has rewritten or will rewrite everyone else in this room. Oh yeah, I don't doubt it. I mean, everything I read about Hollywood says that despite the fact that without writers they they'd have nothing, uh, which they sort of know, which is how the strike ended, you know. Yeah. Uh, nonetheless, they they go back. They just, you know, writers are fired without a phone call. You know. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, I don't care for that. No. No, I mean, I I you know, I've read all of William Goldman's books on 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 life in Hollywood, and God, I, I have sort too. of marvel at it. Yeah. Easy said, money at the brick factory. He said, "If some some satan some hellish person ever sentenced him to run a studio, the first thing he would do is get assign somebody to read all the all the scripts that have been tossed on the trash pile." <laughs> yeah, that's what they're doing in hell, I'm sure. I recall reading about um, the creation of 2001 you know, and the partnership of Arthur C. Clarke with Stanley Kubrick mm -hmm. and how, you know, that was kind of a tense relationship. And um, I think they had some differences of opinion. Oh, I bet they um, did. Yeah. Isn't, yeah. That, isn't that why Clarke wrote the novel in the end? Um, I think so. I mean, I think he wanted to, he wanted his vision of the story 
which was a little more, it was less surreal and poetic, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was more prosaic and, and, uh, and, you know, it was, I thought, so at one point I, having seen the movie a few times, and then I read the novel and I thought, wow, you know, that's what it meant. And then I realized later that that's what it meant to Arthur C. Clarke, but that's not necessarily what it mm. meant to Stanley Kubrick, who, in fact, Kubrick didn't really want to create something that was that open to interpretation. He wanted to raise questions. He wanted, and he wanted people to, you know, I mean, poetry doesn't necessarily make sense at a level of just pure intellect. Yeah. But it digs in, to, you know, you know, it's kind of an emotional experience and that's the way the film was supposed to be. And I think it worked. Especially, yeah. especially in 70 millimeter, you know, if, oh. if you can see it in the original format, I mean, it really is. Cinerama. Mm -hmm. I did see it in Cinerama originally, and that was pretty spectacular. And uh, when they re-released it not long ago, they they did an IMAX version of it, which was similar to the Cinerama wow. version. Pretty spectacular. Wow. Uh, well, that's, I do you know, wish you would write a screenplay uh, or me? a teleplay. Well, uh, now they make read, many series. You wanted to write a screenplay that gets gets made. Yeah. Well, absolutely. But I, I was just thinking, I mean, you know, these mini series that now you don't have to write a two hour movie. You can write a 10 hour movie and they'll shoot it in, as episodes and produce it for some cable channel. Well, I've had, you know, I've had interest in, in nibbles, you know, over the years. And uh, some uh, I've also had some uh, uh, requests from students who are doing, you know, projects for their classroom and I always give them you know permission it's of course thank you thank you for having the courtesy to ask thank you for knowing that you have to ask and uh, uh but I'll give a I'll give a student anything you know to do what it is you know whatever it is and um but I get I get inquiries every so often here and there and uh not a lot, but it's been steady over over the years. I certainly certainly haven't turned anyone down. Well, I think it would be great for you to have a uh, script uh, you know, made into a movie, um, and even if it wasn't, uh, if it, if they did the usual movie uh, company thing of totally changing it, then you could have a book <laughs> that come out, and so you could be double dipping there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, you know, I'll try anything twice just to make sure. So I, I've never been asked to write a screenplay, but, you know, and uh, and I would um, I wouldn't just write one on spec because uh, I don't buy groceries on spec. So. I am uh, I'm, I'm remembering. Um... You know, years ago, you may remember this too. You were probably there at ArmadilloCon uh, when Gibson showed up, and he had—I think he had sold Johnny Mnemonic, uh, and he was all decked out. He was wearing expensive clothes. Yeah, yep. kind of blew my mind. It just, yeah, I he had gone Hollywood. <laughs> and it, yeah, uh, Hollywood know, Bill the Gibson. Film, the, the film was pretty interesting, and uh, uh, what is it? The the one other thing that they've shot of his work was the peripheral, which they uh, made into a mini series for Amazon. Yeah. And I think that's the way to do it. If you're gonna if you're gonna try to capture a novel, yeah. uh, you got to give it time. You got to give it like eight hours or ten hours or twelve, something like that. Yeah. Well, you know, and and. That's what people people want to see. Actually, is they want to see how much how much novel gets into the gets on the screen, and uh, oh, and they like quibbling over the differences and 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 everything. But uh, I learned a lot about what um, what works on screen and what works on the page, and and doesn't always translate. And Wendy, you'll remember this if you if you read the uh, 
William Goldman book about hobbling when they, when they were making Oh, yes, misery. yes, yes. They had endless meetings about what was yeah. to be done to James Kahn in misery. Yeah, because in the book, he I she amputates his foot. Right. And, it was, and I think he was lopping. And they had all these discussions about whether he could have his foot cut off. And yeah. Yeah. yeah and the, and the uh, I guess the director and everyone decided we can't cut his foot off on screen. They'll never allow it. Well, no, it was it was that they would make him a loser. Yeah, it would make him a loser. And William Goldman was absolutely, you know, opposite this. He was he was against it the whole time until he saw it on the screen. And then he said, Yeah, they had to they had to hobble him. It would have been too much to cut his foot off. The other interesting thing in his discussion of that movie was about casting, where he talked about casting Kathy Bates. Mm -hmm. And because she was at the time an unknown quantity. You know, she she had not done movies before. Yeah. She'd been a stage actress. And, you know, that that sort of gave a sort of extra bit of danger to it because nobody was really sure what she would do. Whereas, you know, if you have a known star, you kind of have, yeah. you have a sense of what that star is willing to, willing to do and not do on screen. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I have no more words of wisdom. I'm not sure I had any when I got here. But uh, I think and we are at the end of the hour. Ahead. Oh, OK. I was going to say I have a question. OK. Which okay. is, like, do you think it is harder? And if so, how for someone to get started doing the kind of work that you writing science fiction in, in, in the current era? Is it or do we always think it's harder? Oh, there are some things that are harder, you know, than than they were other times when I when I was getting started, the the natural thing was you you wrote short fiction for the magazines, and the editor book editors would you know would pay attention to you, and then eventually you'd write a book, and you know, and then you'd write more books and so forth and so on. And uh, um, when I uh, when I was finally you know kind of an established name. This was wasn't true at all. There were very few magazines left, and very few markets for short fiction, and most people were selling novels right away rather than you know, than short fiction, and um, and now with uh, online, online and ebook, it's much easier to you know it's like you can establish a magazine just by you know. Just by saying, okay, I've got a magazine, you get the web space for it and everything. But there are now, again, many more markets for short fiction. And, um, but then there's the internet, and that comes with its own problems. And you, um, one of the problems is that people can react to something immediately, and then someone else can react to that reaction immediately and before you know it there's a big conflagration and people are jumping on each other and there isn't uh there isn't any uh cooling off period that, that people used to have when they couldn't respond immediately to something that's like another that's like another of William Goldman's things about he didn't he couldn't write for theater because he couldn't cope with the immediate response. Mm -hmm. We have actually gone over our hour, so I think that we have to wrap it up. And I really hope you will come back soon because we just can't seem to stop. I we know. have more and more that we want to talk about. I know. Thanks so much for joining us, Pat. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Thanks for, and thanks for sitting through my wittering on so patiently. And, no, uh, no problem. and maybe next time I'll appear on camera, but I don't make any promises. Okay, give us a look. Cool. Cool. Okay, I'll talk to you guys soon. You can stay in touch with Plutopia at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.